Okay, welcome to our next discipleship class. And um, so we're going to do part two of this eSword tutorial. Uh, we had started last week and went through the Bible and dictionaries. And I would like to um, jump into some of the other features. So we do have some great features. Um, why don't we take a look, first of all, at uh, Bible commentary. So on the right-hand side, notice we have some Bible commentaries. Now, each of these commentaries, um, they have their uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, I don't use, like, for example, um, there's very few of them I would use for eschatology, which is the study of end times. Uh, I may use, uh, starting from the ABCs up, um, I would use the uh, Believer's Bible Commentary or the Bible Knowledge Commentary. I'd use Chuck Smith. Um, <clears throat> I would use Thomas Constable. Uh, again, this is for end times, uh, more modern understanding a thing in the When Critics Ask, uh, if it's an issue that certainly relates to end times eschatology. Uh, they can definitely be trusted. Uh, Keithley and Walverud, their commentary on the book of Revelation. Again, it's contemporary, dispensational, and it's uh, very good. Uh, David Guzik, obviously, uh, again, very sound. Here's another uh, study in Revelation with Keithley only. Uh, and as I jump up, uh, Scott, he is also good in Revelation. And let's see. Uh, Utley would be good. Again, he's uh, evangelical, so wouldn't Worsby be. Uh, again, evangelical, uh, relatively modern. And Kenneth Wiest is, in the, um, in the issues that he deals with, uh, we, we don't have a commentary in the book of Revelation from him. Uh, there is a dictionary, uh, under dictionaries, that is... Up here, you can actually see Wiest has the I. Now, I don't know if I showed you this, but over in the dictionary topics, if you click this little book, uh, it does take a second. But what it does is it brings you up this little area on the right side of the dictionary window to be able to search things out. In other words, um, in Wiest, uh, if I wanted to click on him. Uh, notice there's a number of topics. So, for example, um, oh, I don't know if you wanted to go over the word uh, agape, love. So, notice if I hold my arrow over these because they, they don't really expand well. Um, it expands the larger window, but not this narrow window. So, uh, you can just hold your your arrow over there and it'll show you like uh, citizens you only see citizens it's citizens of heaven uh, number 30 and gets into our citizenship in heaven and yeah he just kind of drills down on the greek words he used to teach greek at uh, moody bible institute in chicago so uh, he's a tremendous advantage but unfortunately he only did certain new testament books so as we go through here um over in the commentary section again, we have the same um, tools that are provided. We can do a search. For example, I'm in the uh, Believer's Bible Commentary by McDonald. Um, and if I do a search, uh, again, I can search on whatever I want. Uh, for example, uh, if I type in tribulation. And hit enter it's going to give me everywhere where tribulation appears in the believers bible commentary and as i scroll down notice it highlights it so in the book of revelation uh, again as i scroll down tribulation is highlighted now if i decide you know what uh, i want to look at another bible commentary but i don't want to close down the window then i can just select it um, perhaps um, I would jump into like, for example, uh, if I was in the book of Revelation, uh, cease, 
Uh, he's actually good in that, though. He's old. Uh, let's see if he has the word tribulation. Yes, he does. So uh, Cease is actually very good on the, um, the book of Revelation, though he is one of the ancients. Uh, he did a tremendous job. And, um, you know, I think that um, we could certainly benefit from him, though uh, his eschatology may not be exactly what we, uh, in a sense, are looking for. So um, what I did actually was I went through and gathered the information on these various Bible commentators. And I have, um, I have a Microsoft Word uh, document uh, that I think that we can take advantage of here, take a look at. Um, so this, this document... Um, really goes through and I can email it out to anybody that wants it just email me at um, Bible made clear at gmail.com uh, I will email this out to you it's essentially uh, kind of a brief uh, on each of the commentaries it gives you uh, their theological direction uh, notice the expositors Bible commentary uh, though very, very good. Um, it has a Calvinistic leaning. Uh, it's one of the most recognized standards of expository commentaries. Now, again, um, this is an older commentary, but it is, it is very valuable. Uh, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't particularly worry about whether a commentary is Calvinistic, um, like this has here, uh, varied theologies because they have multiple um, contributors that come from different backgrounds or as we go down here even in grants it says uh, uh, his theology really is unknown uh, also with the uh, preacher's complete homiletic commentary um, the PHC again varied theologies so uh, we get down to constable now we call constable dispensational uh, he's a Dallas seminary graduate um, and he is uh, dispensational in his approach to scripture and eschatology so uh, I like him you know all around I think he's uh, pretty sound all around um, and you know, obviously Calvin's complete commentary set he would definitely have a Calvinistic leaning right since uh, he's the one that everybody coins the phrase from his name but um, but um, Constable, he's, he's evangelical, he's dispensational, uh, and any of the ones that are dispensational, we would say, are evangelical. I, I put Chuck Smith under evangelical because, um, though uh, Calvary Chapel, uh, we are kind of in the middle uh, with a balance. We're really, we don't really fall into a particular um, corner of theology in that sense. We're not Calvinistic. We're not uh, Arminianistic. Um, we're evangelical. We're also, uh, uh, I guess, properly dispensational, but not um, cessationist. So we obviously believe in the gifts, but not hyper-Pentecostal. So uh, we're a little bit tough to define. And uh, depending upon the Calvary Chapel pastor, you'd get a leaning one way or the other. So that's why I kind of categorized him as that. Um, you know, you get a number of these other ones that are typically, um, you know, Calvinistic or Arminian or somewhere in between. Now, William Barclay's Daily Study Bible. Now, notice it says, and he's the only one, a professing universalist. You say, well, what do you have him in there for? Well, um, he will discount miracles. He will um, give you a, a lopsided view when it comes to uh, highly doctrinal issues. However, when it comes to like New Testament background, um, just some of the, the cultural um, uh, historical workings um, in the context of where you're reading, uh, he was just really tremendous. Uh, I guess he didn't focus as much on theology, which is why his theology is pretty bad. But I don't, I don't read him to get my doctrinal understanding. If I want to get some nuance uh, out of uh, history or culture uh, in a particular area, you know, I look uh, for him there. 
Uh, but other than that, no. I mean, you know, you'll uh, you could end up uh, really on the wrong side of eternity if you listen to him uh, in reference to those type things. But um, again, w you know, these are all listed out here. I'll just kind of slowly leaf through them in case you are not interested in the document. Um, see if I can pull up any ones here that I particularly like. Um, Arno Gabling can be, again, very, very helpful, and he's classified as dispensational along with the Revelation commentary by Keith Lee and Walvoord. Again, they're both, um, they're both uh, Dallas graduates. Um, Walvoord uh, was a professor there for, uh, for the most part, his career. So um, he would obviously have that particular perspective. Um, this guy, Thomas Koch, um, it says Thomas Koch is one of the founders of the Methodist Church in the United States, right? He worked alongside John Wesley. Um, the Methodist Church got its name because Wesley, Wesley taught a particular method of Bible study that they followed, and uh, they became the Methodists. It's not that difficult. However, uh, Koch can be very, very insightful. A lot of these older commentators, now they're terrible when it comes to eschatology because there was not a lot of eschatology that was uh, fully developed when they were writing. Um, I don't think they focused on it for the most part, but some of these older guys that have been, you know, gone for, um, you know, over a century or whatever, they, um, they can still have tremendous contributions. Uh, Matthew Poole is like that. Uh, it, again, tremendous. Uh, William Newell, again, dispensational, but very, very much, um, uh, you know, an advantage to read. Now, this guy, William Kelly, he's interesting. Um, he doesn't, f I don't know where he falls. He doesn't fall into Calvinistic or Arminian. Um, as a matter of fact, um, he was quoted as saying that, um, you know, he was neither Calvinist nor Arminian, and he thought they were both wrong. <laughs> so, um, but he was one of the brethren, uh, Plymouth brethren, that is. Um, and so he came kind of from that perspective, which they typically are Calvinistic, but uh, his leaning was away from both. Um, and uh, I also like uh, uh, Whedon, Daniel Whedon. Again, he's an Arminian. Um, and uh, actually, his uh, name is spelt wrong uh, over next to Arminian. But uh, so Whedon, uh, and again, th these in these parentheses here, as you're looking at them, uh, the parentheses here, uh, and I'll change this as I'm talking to you. Um, so the parentheses are actually how they appear in the tabs uh, within the uh, Esword commentary. Um, but I, I really like Whedon, he, tremendously insightful. As a matter of fact, I quoted him a number of times in my book um, on rediscovering Romans 9, um, uh, which you can uh, search on Amazon and find if you're interested. But um, I also like uh, uh, Frederick, Frederick Louis Godet. Uh, he is again very, very insightful and thorough if you really want to dig in. Um, uh, really, a, a lot of these are, are good. I, I like Adam Clark. Um, the People's New Testament is very brief, but it's, it's simple. It's straightforward. And, and again, um, I think that, um, you, know, you know, you look at Calvinistic or Arminian, uh, m most of these commentaries are not uh, pounding that issue. Uh, the, in other words, their, their goal is not to present themselves as an Arminian or a Calvinist. Their goal is to try to uh, just exegete the Bible. Now, in doing that, you're going to get either a Calvinistic or Arminian slant when it gets, when it gets to verses uh, that really address some of those issues. And, um, and I think that we also need to remember that uh, some of them are strong Calvinists. I mean, it, you know, they are kind of on the extreme end. And some of them, you know, they, you know, they certainly lean that way, but it's not that important to them. 
Uh, same thing with the Armenians. Um, you know, they're not uh, pounding the pulpit on uh, anything that uh, is typically Armini, uh, within the Armenian uh, branch of theology. But if you get to verses where it's dealing with free will, um, then the Calvinists are going to lean towards uh, a lack of free will, and the Armenians are going to lean towards free will, uh, libertarian free will in particular. So, uh, but, you know, I mean, look, I've, I've seen uh, a number of the Calvinists uh, or Calvinistic commentaries. I've been pleasantly surprised, especially in some of the grammarians. Now, the grammarians are the guys like Robertson's Word Pictures or Vincent's Word Studies. Uh, these guys are really giving you kind of grammatical, uh, a grammatical approach, and they're, they're not necessarily a commentary. Uh, sometimes they give you comment, but for the most part, they're just giving you grammatical structure or explaining some of the word usages or idioms. And, um, and so they can be really helpful, uh, but they don't, you know, like if you read Vincent, you would think that uh, he's uh, not really Calvinistic. Uh, because he's just pretty much honest and straightforward with uh, the definitions as they sit. Um, now, um, I would never read Albert Barnes for uh, anything that has to do with eschatology, but the rest of the Bible, I mean, I think he does a great job. Uh, his Calvinistic leanings are not um, cumbersome because uh, he actually was, uh, there's a whole <clears throat> you know, problem that he had uh, being a, a Calvinist, uh, he also believed in free will, and uh, it, it created a whole controversy um, with him that uh, really kind of upset a lot of the Calvinistic churches. And so Barnes, um, I just, again, I think that he is, um, like it says here, though classified as a Calvinist, it says, he was at odds with Calvinists because of his perspective on man's free will. So yeah, he's kind of like, um, you know, Spurgeon in, in that sense. You know, Spurgeon was not the typical uh, 21st century Calvinist. Um, you know, I would I would disagree with Spurgeon's um, Calvinistic views. I mean, he was a five point Calvinist, so uh, I would disagree with that. Um, however, uh, at the same time, um, you know, Spurgeon functioned like an Arminian. In other words, um, you know, I, I have a whole presentation that I did on Spurgeon uh, where it goes through his own quotes to evaluate him. And he's an interesting guy because, um, you know, he ended up actually fighting with the Calvinists in London and they pretty much ostracized him. They were angry at him and they didn't like him. Uh, because he would not fit into their mold. He would not do the normal, um, you know, kind of five-point Calvinist approach to things in his day. Now, he believed like they did. However, when the Bible told him to go preach, you know, to all creation, well, he took it serious and he did it. As a matter of fact, uh, I have a quote of his where it talks about he would rather be inconsistent with himself than inconsistent with scripture. So if he came to a place where it's like, well, you know what, this, if I do this, it's inconsistent with my theology. Um, however, uh, the Bible's telling me to do it, so I'm going to do it. You know what? I don't really care whether he's a Calvinist or Arminian at that point or, or in between. He's doing what the Bible is telling him to do. Uh, he's going out, he's preaching to everybody. Um, whether he saw all men savable or not, he wasn't worried about that. He preached to everybody equally. And um, he let God decide where the chips were going to fall. But from a functional standpoint, Spurgeon operated like an Arminian, though he believed like a Calvinist. So uh, he was a little bit of an enigma to a number of people of his day. Now, uh, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, though, has a Calvinistic leaning a little bit, uh, you know, is categorized as dispensational really because, again, they're Dallas guys, and that's kind of their thing. Um, the Believer's Bible Commentary by McDonald, again, uh, though he isn't a Dallas guy um, per se, 
uh, he was still really dispensational. And Worsby, too. Worsby, uh, somebody asked Warren Worsby at a conference one time in the question and answer period. They said, are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? And he said, I'm neither. He said, I'm no man's disciple. He said, um, you know, I'm a biblicist. And um, uh, so, in other words, I follow what the Bible says. I'm not going to be categorized under some man. And then, uh, you know, read my Bible through the, the perspective of one individual. Um, I, I, I think that's great wisdom. So Worsby was uh, much more balanced than many. Uh, in that regard, though, I think he had a little bit of a Calvinistic leaning, but that's fine. Um, I don't really care. Uh, look, I use all these guys, and I, I get the benefit out of them that I can. So if you want this, like I said, I put it into a PDF. I can email it to you. Just let me know. So that's um, that's the uh, Microsoft Word. Now, if you were to, um, let's see, if you were to go up into the eSword up top here. See where it's turning yellow, these three little books up top? Um, that is called the reference library. So, um, oh, and before I leave the commentaries, it, it functions the same. You get the search here, you search on page. So whatever is down in this area, you can search on the page. Um, you can magnify it, um, like for example, uh, some of the commentaries like the, um, uh, the Cambridge New Testament, uh, very, very small writing. So you can just, you know, you can enlarge it. And then when you, you know, you go back to like this one, that's too big for me anyway. So I size it down to be normal. Again, you get your link to connect it with whatever verse you got on the left side. And this V is that you're looking at it uh, from whatever verse comments. You can also look at chapter. Now, there's no chapter comments here. Now, Barnes has a chapter comment in Matthew 24. And then there's the book comments. Now, this would be the introduction, right, to Matthew or under the BBC, right? Um, you know, that's not the British Broadcasting Company. That's the Believer's Bible Commentary. But again, you have uh, the introduction here. And again, with many of these under the book, the B, right, book comments, the book introductions, um, they can really go through and give you some great information. And, you know, uh, like here with Constable, uh, sometimes they give you little tables to lay things out. Again, you know, it, there's there's more stuff here than you'll read uh, until the rapture happens, whenever that is, which would be great if it's sooner rather than later, but that's another story. So anyways, if we move on over to the reference and we bring up the reference library, um, notice that in the reference library, um, you know, I have this book up. Now, what I have up right now is um, notice up top, it says Schaefer's uh, Systematic Theology. So <clears throat> there's a there's basically a drop down menu. So you you hit the drop down menu and, uh, you know, I got Spurgeon sermons uh, right underneath. Right. So if we stick with uh, Schaefer's for a moment, um, though, this is a book actually that uh, needs to be purchased. It's not a freebie. Um, it, it's a good systematic theology. Again, Schaefer is one that founded Dallas um, and. <clears throat> We have um, also the ability here to search out, um, and again, there's there's the chapters, right? So this can go to, you know, you can kind of push it over to the side or um, pull it out. But uh, we have the chapters, so we're in so, uh, soteriology, right, which is the doctrine of salvation. But we could go down to... Uh, ecclesiology dealing with the church and again you can make this bigger by hitting the little plus sign here if the writing is too small uh, you can search in the page um, <clears throat> ecclesiology so we should uh, find the word church in here and yes we do right and then you can find the next one and the next one so that would be obvious since uh, ecclesiology is a study of the church and then uh, you can search the entire um, 
thing, just like any of those. And again, this this comes up. Um, so church appears in all these different chapters, right? So if I decide, hey, I don't want to search Schaefer's, uh, I want to search Spurgeon's sermons for church. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, it's going to come up a number of times. So uh, you got all these different sermons with it. And then he's uh, dealing with the church. So if we look at the pull down menu here, now I got, I have personally, I got a ton of books here. And that's pretty much what this is. The, the reference library is books that you read in a different, well, I guess it's a similar format, but they're not um, cross referencing um, really back to, um, you know, the commentaries and all that. So, uh, for example, if I if I did want to, um, you know, look up uh, something that Wesley wrote. Right. So uh, Wesley has his different sermons um, and uh, maybe Sir Robert Anderson. Right. The coming prince. Um, this is where he, he really goes through and lays out Daniel chapter nine and the 70 weeks Um and I mean, you get the Antonisi fathers, right? So uh, the Council of Nicaea was 325 AD. So the post Nicene fathers were after 325. The Anti Nicene fathers were prior. And again, you know, if you click on one of these, not that this is interest to everybody, but, um, you know, I know like I've gone through and copied stuff out from Irenaeus, uh, his against heresies. So again, you know, it's like, you know, the 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 opportunity for just looking through here. And again, I have both Calvinistic to Arminian and everything in between here. Got a number of books by Lewis Sperry Schaefer. Um, and again, in Spurgeon sermons, um, you have them here. Uh, he will they they list out um, all the sermons now you can drag that over. And so, but he does it, notice it starts out kind of alphabetical. So you have uh, First Chronicles uh, 21. And then, you know, you get to First Kings, First Samuel. So you can see, and then the number two. And then after that, as you go down here, you know, you're, you're to Jonah, Joshua, uh, Lamentations, Malachi, Matthew. And so uh, Micah, so they they go alphabetically. They don't they don't stay with how the Bible is laid out. Uh, they give you the sermon number. Um, he's got one here. Uh, the need of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, uh, the need of the age, the Holy Spirit, the number. And then again, you can just uh, enlarge it if you want. And you can read through his sermons. I mean, this is volumes volumes of information um, you know I have a number of volumes behind me and then on the other side of the room and uh, this would just fill the the whole room so um, you know whatever you're looking for there's a ton of stuff in there R.A. Torrey he was the pastor of the Church of the Open Doors in uh, Los Angeles California before J. Vernon McGee pastored it um, so he was at the kind of the turn of the 20th century into the 20th century. And then uh, J. Vernon McGee took it over. So uh, R.A. Torrey, again, just some tremendous um, and simple, uh, insightful books uh, and, and short little pamphlets that he has written. Uh, look at them all. I mean, there's a ton of them. So, um, you know, this one on how to study the Bible uh, is very helpful. It's not... Hugely extensive, but it is helpful. Uh, he goes through, you know, topical study um, uh, examples. And again, he, he's not very detailed as far as like going into great lengths uh, of explaining a lot of stuff. Uh, but he will like, you know, st uh, study of the books in order. Right. I mean, that's the chapter. <laughs> not much there. Right. Um, but he gives you the framework to do your own work. Uh, he doesn't get overly extensive um, in, in much of what he does. Now, he has one in here on, uh, let's see if I can find it real quick, on the, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then he also has one on um, 
what the Bible teaches. So uh, here it is here. Uh, he has what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. Um, this is very helpful. Um, this is out of his what the Bible uh, teaches. Uh, he has a larger book uh, called what the Bible teaches. But um, but this one on the Holy Spirit, it, it's done like this. He gives you kind of this, um, you know, these propositions, um, the work of the Holy Spirit, right? The baptism with the Holy Spirit, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit and the apostles. And then he gives you the supporting verses. And, um, you know, he'll ask questions if the Holy Spirit, like, for example, here, right? Uh, we'll enlarge this a little for you. Um, if the Holy Spirit is the offer of the words of Scripture, how do we account for variations in style and dis and uh, diction from the human writers? Answer, uh, the Holy Spirit is quite wise enough and has quite enough linguistic faculty in um, revealing truth to use words, phrases, and forms of expression in an individual's vocabulary and to use that person's particular individuality. Uh, and again, God does not put aside a person's uh, intellect or or uh, the demeanor of their thinking and uh, their their mood and all that. I mean, God uses all that to express what he wants to express and brings it out perfectly. So um, so then he gets his sixth proposition from this, the utterances of the apostles and the prophets uh, down here. Uh with the word of God, when we read these words, we are not listening to the voice of a man, but to the voice of God. Uh, so simple, so insightful. So that is um, that is how the um, the reference library is laid out. And um, so next, I want to take a quick look. So we'll go back to Esort here, and we'll take a quick look at um, the map index all right so if we were to go up at go up to the uh, top of the e sword where the <clears throat> um, uh, the reference library is right next to it you have the maps so in, in the maps uh, what we have is a number of these now this first one uh, map showing locations Old Testament events right this uh, ABB tab here uh, you can go on the right and um, you know it, you obviously don't have much of a selection so you can run the you know the uh, arrow up and down on the slider on the right you get a little more map but like, for example, the American Bible Society maps, the next one, uh, this may be more uh, what we see in the back of our Bibles, right? Um, you know, New Testament in Jerusalem. Uh, over on the right, you can click on any of these, Paul's uh, journeys to Rome. And you can, again, you can also enlarge these to look at them in that way. Uh, so as you go across here, um, that may not be something that interests everybody, which is dealing with the Hebrew alphabet. But we have uh, this one on Bible Atlas, right? So, again, the pull down on the right has a number of, uh, as a matter of fact, it has 132 selections. Uh, notice it says Christian expansion in the 2nd and 3rd century. So you go there. And, again, it gives you kind of a map of um, how the expansion grew. And, again, if you can't see it, you hit the larger thing and then you can kind of move it around with the little hand here you click and hold it and you can uh, move it around the um, this is the blue letter bible um, so a number of people like the blue letter bible online but uh, you get again uh, a number of um, uh, maps uh, some of these are older and you get um, uh, bullinger's witness in the stars so uh, again, this is really something taken out of his book where he explains the gospel and the stars. Um, interesting concept. Uh, you get end times charts here. Uh, so these are from LaHaye and Ice. Uh, really good. Uh, I think, again, uh, 
you know, you can't beat some of this stuff as a layout. You got classic uh, map layouts. Um, th there's not a huge selection here, but uh, these are the old classic ones. Um, again, now you got some some pictures here, uh, you know, that are really not maps at all. Um, this one here is a companion um, and a companion to an index, which again, if you don't have the other thing to reference the, uh, the, the pictures to, then it's not going to make much sense. You get the CIA fact book. Um, again, some older historical maps. This is the in standard, uh, international standard version maps. Uh, notice they're a little more modern looking. Paul's missionary journey, a little, a little easier to see. Um, Clarence Larkin, um, you know, he, he has a lot of stuff from, uh, you know, drawn out in these. Uh, he had these long um, kind of fold out books that were um, uh, pretty helpful. You know, a lot of the information in it is uh, helpful. Um, lineages and times right? Uh, different uh, timelines that we have here. Uh, just to kind of show you, that's um, Abraham to Joseph. You know, then we have David, right? Um, so this can be very helpful for people to figure out who is related to who, right? Um, and it also, it goes across the bottom. So if you were to go all the way to the bottom right, the lineage of David, right? And we can pick... Um, you know, the Lord Jesus. So, uh, again, you can see how it's laid out. It gives you the list from Luke and Matthew. Uh, Mark and John do not give any genealogy at all. Um, so, you have a Mediterranean view. Uh, the Mediterranean basin there and uh, some of the, uh, the maps like... Um, Asia Minor um, and, you know, like the northern Gaul area. So, again, you start looking at uh, some of these older names for places and, uh, you know, you're, um, you're at least uh, getting some kind of a bird's eye view of the area. There's NASA maps, uh, if you're interested in that. I mean, all this stuff is uh, pretty interesting. Um, again... Um, you know, you want to know what you're looking at here. Uh, otherwise, you know, you can go look at Google Maps for that. And here we have uh, the Net Bible maps. Uh, the Net Bible is uh, uh, a different translation. And again, now they're they're more kind of black and white. Um, you know, uh, not a lot of color, but very very easy to see. So uh, again. You know, this is the Exodus, shows you where they came across. Um, this is just timelines. Um, and <clears throat> again, you know, this would probably have to be blown up so that you can see it a lot better. But um, again, it gives you uh, timelines if you're interested in that. And then various Bible maps. I'm going to size this back down. Uh, and, and this is... Um, this is showing you uh, Israel's exodus, but, you know, we can actually go to Palestine in the time of Christ. And then again, you get the, the different cities and where they're laid out and everything else. So, so that's, the, um, that's the maps. Uh, we can kind of uh, shut the maps off. So, so we're back to Esword. Um, and... <clears throat> we've gone through, uh, I think, uh, all the pieces. Uh, the only thing I think that I didn't really go through much was the editors, uh, the journals, the study notes, and topic notes. Uh, I think I did explain that journal notes are based on the date. Um, if you want to put a note in here, you know, Sunday, May 23rd, 2021, um, you know, if I was doing a daily journal, if I was using this as opposed to typing in a book, um, 
you know, or, or printing in a, a manual journal, then I would just type it in here. And I have my own journal notes on a daily basis. Uh, the study notes, you know, I've explained those to you. Um, you know, uh, even here, you know, I can highlight something um, and then I can right click and paste into study notes. And then all of a sudden I look at my study notes and there's the phrase that I just pasted over there. So now I could have right clicked and just did copy um, and then pasted it into Microsoft Word or some other um, Word editor, which is fine too. But what this does, as long as you have this link here, this little um, uh, key link selected, every time you bring up Matthew 24, 15, you're going to get this note. Uh, so, so this becomes notes that you put in or want to remember based on particular verses of the Bible. And, um, you know, if you just wanted to do it by chapter, you could select, you know, 24 verse 1. And then you know that you always do verse one and then you just kind of lay out all your notes or whatever. And then there's the topic notes. That's done by topic, uh, new topic note, um, you know. So I can, I can add, uh, again, a new topic to the notes. And then, you know, then I'm, you know, sanctification or, you know, uh, mercy, not Mary. You know, mercy of God, we can deal with that. And then um, and then we can end up uh, with actually the new topic typed in here. And then now I can start typing my uh, mercy notes. So <clears throat> now under mercy... Uh, bottom line is I can start typing in anything I want. So I, you know, I, I only have to select this little um, page here for new topic that's next to the, the where the topic is laid out. And then uh, I'll be able to list out whatever uh, notes by topic I prefer. So it can be very helpful. It just depends on what you want to do. So this is a very, very helpful, excuse me, um, chair's not working well, um, very helpful uh, program. It's free. Um, I, I really think that, you know, you can take advantage of it if you're not using another Bible program, I would say if you're not using a Bible program because you can search through so many books, so much information, uh, just, you know, clicking around on the screen, um, it, it's it's almost a waste to not use it. Uh, some people have purchased some very, very expensive programs. I have another one that's, um, you know, it, it's hundreds of dollars. And um, uh, to be honest with you, I hardly use it. Um, you know, it's good for certain things. It's mainly good for word studies and stuff like that. But uh, I'm just not overly impressed with it, even though, you know, I bought it more for the content um, than, than kind of the usability. I actually like how, um, how eSword works because I can uh, move around in it the way I want. I can control it. Um, and again, I believe that I did show you this uh, last week up the top here. Um, you know, you can change the views. Uh, they're right up next to the, the uh, graphics viewer, which is the maps, and then the reference library. So I think that's about it. I, um, now, if, um, if you want me, like I had uh, said earlier, if you want me to send the, uh, the document that has the listing of the commentaries, just send me an email. Also, um, I do have a document that, um, here, let me grab it real quick and show it to you. So this is a uh, PDF, actually, um, of a document, uh, basically, that goes over the, um, the tense, the mood, and the voice. Uh, and kind of give examples and explains them. Now, I, I kind of copied this off of um, 
uh, as you can see when you go over the reference um, these are from the uh, let's see the uh, preceptboston.org uh, they get a ton of resources on there but uh, I've kind of copied it down into a document so that it's just easier to focus on and I don't have to kind of work my way around the website to find it but it's like the the voice um, of verbs uh, active passive and middle you know I talked about that before but this again uh, if you're really interested in digging into words uh, gives you kind of uh, some of the the basics without having to know Greek uh, but will definitely be a help uh, and again I would send it out to you if you um, send me an email to uh, Bible made clear at gmail.com and I will send either one of those uh, documents out to you um, and I think that's about it so if you have any questions I'll try to answer them you could email me at the same email address but other than that um, I think uh, two weeks on eSword is more than adequate and um, you know I hope you do take advantage of it so uh, until next time, may God richly bless you as you continue to study his word.